It's the story the world's been talking about. Do I have this right? A rape victim is ordered to pay her rapist child support? Just the amount of people that are now asking questions is extraordinary. A 16-year-old girl, a 30-year-old man. I think that John Bourne's committed a crime uh, in December of 2005. I absolutely did. Their child at the center of a shocking custody fight. I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. You've seen the Chris Nakamoto investigation. Now, go inside the case. What do you want to tell the public about your daughter? The investigative unit with new details and a new angle you rarely get to see. This is a WBRZ special news presentation. It all started with an email that was sent to the investigative unit on May 6th of 2022 titled Rapist Awarded Custody of Child Conceived During Sexual Assault. And so immediately that had my mind saying, wait, how could this happen? So start reading and then reading some more. I see attachments that are attached to the email that basically substantiate what is in the email. So then I pick up the phone and I say, let's schedule a time to chat. And that's when I got in touch with the founder of this nonprofit who wound up giving us all of this information about what had happened to Krista Abelseth over the years. Krista says she was at a bar in Ponchatoula when she was at the age of 16. She wanted a ride home. She claims that John Barnes offered to bring her home. Well, instead of bringing her home, she says that he brought her to his house where she claims he raped her on his sofa in her living room. He offered to bring me home that night because my friend wanted to leave early. Krista Abelseth knows all too well about overcoming adversity. The 32-year-old is the mother of a 16-year-old who we are not naming or identifying because she's a minor. She was also born from a rape. He was a 30-year-old man and I was 16. As she's telling us all of these different things that have happened to her over the years, we're just literally incredulous. We cannot believe what we're hearing. Abel Seth recalls meeting this man, John Barnes, at a bar in Hammond back in 2005. He offered to take her home. Instead of bringing me home, he brought me to his home. And once inside, he proceeded to rape me on his living room couch. Abel Seth did not know Barnes before that night, but came away from it pregnant. Um, everybody else just assumed it was from a boyfriend, and I just let them believe that. Multiple years go by, and then she says that one of her friends was out and had run into John Barnes and said, hey, you might have a daughter from an encounter that you had with this girl Krista from six years ago. Abel Seth had a healthy baby girl, and everything was fine until John Barnes learned sometime in 2011 that he might have a daughter. When my daughter was five years old, uh, he found out about her. And once he found out about her, he basically pursued custody and wanted to take her away from me. But that's when he had petitioned the courts in 2011 for custody of the minor child. At that time, a judge awarded 50-50 custody to John Barnes and began forcing John Barnes to pay Krista child support to the tune of about $400 a month and they granted him 50-50 custody, despite the fact that it was caused through rape. This DNA test is part of court documents that show with 99.97% .97 probability, John Barnes is the child's father. Problem is, Barnes was 30 years old and Abel Seth was 16, making it illegal even if it were consensual. Abel Seth maintains it was never consensual. Things are kind of gray between that time frame and what happened this year when he was awarded full custody. But we do know after he was awarded 50-50 custody in 2011, a few years after that, she went and filed a police report. Seven years ago in July of 2015, Abel Seth pressed charges against Barnes. This report she filed with the Tangipahoe Parish Sheriff's Office for simple rape details everything that was done to her.
and I asked her, why did you wait so long to file a police report? And she said, I was 16 at the time. I didn't think if I didn't file it right then that I could ever file it, but she was actually dealing with some trauma from the situation. And it was a grief counselor who actually told her, hey, you actually have 30 years until after you turn 18 to file any sort of report. That's the statute of limitations. And so she went and filed that report in 2015, July 1st of 2015 literally sat on the shelf of the Tangipaho Parish Sheriff's Office for that amount of time. From 2015 until now, nothing has happened with the report, and the Sheriff's Office tells us it's still open. It was never assigned to any detective, and nothing was ever investigated. A detective was, I guess, took her statement, but after that, it went nowhere. There was really no detective after the initial report was taken in, I guess maybe by an intake deputy, there was no detective assigned to it. And because no detective was actually assigned to the case, it just kind of sat there in space. Nothing happened. A quick search of John Barnes shows he owns Gumbo Digital Branding, a web company in Ponchatoula. Barnes' website shows the police department as his client. After we left there, we went straight to the courthouse to start pulling those court records. And so as we're going through the court records, looking at what she's saying, trying to cross-reference things, like it's all matching up. Court records in the Tangipaho Parish Courthouse show John Barnes admitted in June of 2011 that he's the biological father of the child. This year, he was granted full custody of that child, even though a criminal complaint was filed against him in 2015. Mysteriously, those records are under seal, hidden from public view. Then we get to this year, which was the big year in question, where the alleged perpetrator, John Barnes, was awarded full custody of this minor child. And all of those records were under seal. So then we started asking ourselves, why would a judge want to put these records under seal when the rest of the case is not under seal? Things took a dramatic turn this year when they say a judge granted Barnes full custody of the child. It happened after Barnes alleged Abelseth gave her daughter a cell phone. Abelseth says she was also ordered to pay him child support. She's been forced to pay her perpetrator. She's been forced to pay the rapist child support. She's been forced to pay his legal fees. And she's been forced to give up custody of this child that's a product of the rape. It, it just makes no sense. The cell phone, claiming that she was in violation of his order of giving the child a cell phone. And time and time again, it looks like we've seen where, you know, she'll file motions, her motions get denied, and then he files motions and his motions get approved or the judge rules in favor of John Barnes. But we still have not been able to pinpoint any sort of connection between Barnes or any of these parties involved. He's well connected. Um, he's threatened me multiple times saying that he has connections in the justice system, so I need to be careful. And that he can take her away from me anytime he wants to. And I never really believed him up until now because it's happened. It's happening. In Louisiana, you know, our food is different, our culture is different, our corruption is different. And so when we look for a connection, we look for any sort of thing that ties them together, that we have paperwork to back up what we're saying. And we have not been able to pinpoint a connection between John Barnes and the judge, John Barnes and the sheriff, John Barnes and the DA, nothing that would really pinpoint why it appears he's getting all of this special treatment. Right now, you are probably saying the same thing that I've been saying since I heard about this story from the get-go. This can't be possible, not in this country. And yet it again gets worse. Do I have this right? A rape victim is ordered to pay her rapist child support? The judge ordered Krista to pay her rapist, John Barnes, child support. And the rapist has actually gotten partial custody of the child? We report the original story last Monday not even knowing the type of traction that it was going to get, it immediately garnered social outrage across the state, across the nation. I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is confounding and deeply disturbing. The child is born from a felony rape that, uh, that it, it, the law mandates, it says shall, the abuser shall not have visitation or any contact with that child.
much less custody. You have multiple national media outlets that are wondering how this could happen. I mean, there are people across the world that are wondering, how does this happen in a developed nation like America? District Attorney Scott Perlew told me his office is now looking into this case after seeing our story. Multiple phone calls to the Tangipaho Parish Sheriff's Office went unreturned today. Again, the Sheriff's Office has been sitting on that rape report since July of 2015. May 23rd, 2022 at 2.30 p.m. That's when we began contacting the Sheriff's Office, but they did not want to do an interview due to the fact that this was an open case. Breaking news. And that breaking news tonight, a judge in Tangipo Parish has unsealed documents tied to a rape victim who was ordered to pay her abuser child support. So after our story aired, uh, the judge unsealed all the court records due to all of this public outcry. Judge Jeffrey Cash made the decision to unseal those documents late today. Written reasons are supposed to be in that file. As we were going through the court records, we thought for certain she couldn't have lost custody over this kid over a cell phone. But it appears that there were some court filings that John Barnes was upset that she was using a cell phone that the mom had originally given to her to do TikToks and also text her boyfriend. They say that she was possibly sexting with a boyfriend. And so the judge had ordered the mom not to give her a cell phone. Court documents released Thursday morning came with an explanation from Judge Jeffrey Cash about why he made the decisions that he did. Tonight, those decisions are being called into question as the world wonders how this happened and focus shifts to the detectives who dropped the ball from the very beginning. In 2015, I believe, is the first time uh, that we took a report uh, from the victim. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, I don't believe that report was assigned to a detective. And that certainly is the fault of the Tangible Parish Sheriff's Office, and we have to own that. The Sheriff's Office failed her by not investigating that complaint. And it certainly appears if that complaint was investigated, certainly these custody awards that have been happening, and especially happening this year, would not have happened because it would have been illegal. You can't give a perpetrator custody of a child that was produced from a rape. New today, details about Judge Jeffrey Cash's decision, forcing Abelseth to pay John Barnes child support. Abelseth says she was 16 when she met Barnes, then 30 at a bar was raped, then got pregnant, now paying him $117 per month. Barnes even going after her when she fell behind on payments. Things took a dramatic turn this year when Judge Cash awarded full custody to Barnes, saying the mother was in contempt for providing the child with a cell phone. But that's not all. A month before the judge gave full custody to the father, the child reported she was sexually assaulted by Barnes for two nights in a row. The teenage girl sought treatment at a hospital in New Orleans where a doctor confirmed there's evidence of a sexual assault. To think that a judge would award custody to somebody when allegations are being made that this child was the product of a rape and now the child is alleging that something happened to her. If I'm the decision maker, I want to see all the evidence and I would at least want to wait to make a decision until I can read what the results of that rape kit are. Due to all of the public outcry, not just in Louisiana, but across the nation and the world, Judge Jeffrey Cash unsealed all of these court records late Wednesday night. It was mysterious in the first place as to why they were sealed. Those unsealed records that we reviewed Thursday morning confirm the victim's story. It appears at this point the judge is trying to say he did not know that any of this was going on, but there were court records that we saw that were unsealed that in February of this year, it was written down in the court record that she alleged that she was raped and the child was produced from that encounter. And so it wasn't until March where sole custody was awarded to John Barnes. If he did read the fine print and knew that Krista was 16 and John Barnes was 30 and did nothing about it, then that means that he was enabling this crime that took place. As we were working on our story Thursday, the Tangipaho Parish Sheriff's Office revealed in a statement only it screwed up the initial rape investigation and decided to turn it over to the district attorney's office for him to prosecute. We're talking about a juvenile uh, as being as a victim. So uh, the, the victim would have been underage uh, 
uh, at the time, I think in the neighborhood of uh, 16, and the uh, the perpetrator, I think, would have been 30. So yes, you you would certainly have at a minimum uh, a coronal knowledge uh, situation that that should have been realized by uh, the deputy who took the report, and it should have been assigned an actual detective at that time. I mean, we certainly don't like doing half-baked stories. We certainly wouldn't do a story without all the information. How can you make a custody decision without having all the evidence before you? As we see with just a little bit of sunshine on the situation, the sheriff did an interview today and the case is still open. We dropped the ball and, and, and there's no excuse for it and, and, and it's certainly very, very problematic. Four days after our story aired, he's been very forthcoming, but prior to that, could not get in touch with him. Very hard to get in touch with anyone in his office. I don't want the public to believe that this was a seven year willful failure, right, to investigate this case. This was a one-time dropping of the ball that resulted in seven years going by. There is a difference, and I hope you can understand that, and I hope you can get that message across to the public. You can kind of pick and choose what you want to do interviews about. I feel like the sheriff was really forced to try to do an interview because of the public outcry that came as a result of our story that aired last week. I also said this is not something that, that, that uh, has uh, occurred basically in the past. It's not something that I've seen happen since. Uh, you know, one time is one time too many. The sheriff maintains when we talk to him that he believes this is an isolated situation, that this is a one-off incident, that he does not think there are any more cases like that. But certainly an another entity could come in and say, hold up, if this happened with this one case, we're going to go take a look at all of your cases and have a review to see if this happened more than once. Sheriff Edwards says his office is responsible for not investigating the rape that was reported seven years ago. But he also blamed the victim for not following up. Had Krista attempted to get back in contact with us at any point in time to ask the status of this or why hasn't someone contacted us, we would have certainly realized our failure. We would have certainly pulled the case, made sure it got assigned a detective and investigated this case. Is that her responsibility though? She filed her report. It's not her responsibility, no. But Chris, I ask you this, I'm just asking you the question. If you were the victim of a sexual assault or an aggravated battery and you filed a police report and you hadn't heard from a detective in three days or three weeks, I'm just asking you, would you pick up the phone and call and say, hey, you know, I haven't heard from anyone. Unsealed court documents last week indicate a month before Judge Jeffrey Cash gave full custody of Abel Seth and Barnes' teenage child to him. The girl reported Barnes sexually assaulted her two nights in a row. And so Krista's daughter, the, the child that was born from the rape, she alleged in February that she was sexually assaulted by John Barnes. And there was a test that was done on her at a hospital in New Orleans. And the court records indicate that a sexual assault took place, that what they had notated in the reports was congruent with a sexual assault. They called it forced entry. And today we wound up asking the sheriff about that and where that evidence is, because we know that one of his detectives went and picked up that rape kit. I would assume it has not been tested. Uh, again, uh, normally as soon as it's tested, they say, hey, it's been tested, it's ready for pickup. So we have not been notified that it's ready for pickup. They claim that there was other evidence disputing the child's claims, which is why they didn't need the rape kit. But still, when the court document says, and I obviously didn't have access to the report because the minor's involved, but when the court document says that a doctor in New Orleans, a children's hospital, said that these injuries were a result of a sexual assault, you would think that you want to at least see the rape kit, right? And today, the sheriff confirmed that that rape kit is still at the crime lab. It has not been tested. There's a big backlog at the Louisiana State Police Crime Lab, and this is just one of those cases that has not been processed yet. It sounds like a decision in the court was made that her allegations were not proven true, and you're telling us that the rape kit wasn't even tested yet. I'm telling you, to the best of my knowledge, the rape kit has not been uh, tested, but I'm also telling you that if you look at the actual exam that was done by the doctors and the medical reports, and you look at the other documentation that exists out there, uh, I don't think there's any question that, that uh, there was no rape that occurred. Do you think John Barnes should be charged for what happened? 
I, I think that John Bourne's committed a crime uh, in December of 2005. I absolutely do. Why have you not arrested him? Well, haven't arrested him because, uh, you know, again, when this case came back to our attention in the February or whenever it was time frame of this year, right? When this case came back to us, there was immediately other cases that were going along with it, other allegations that needed to be investigated that were related. Some of them were complex. Some of them needed subpoenas to go out. We had to wait for returns to come back in. Uh, even while we were doing that, more allegations surfaced that we had to do. Again, all of these cases being related, and we wanted to do everything at one time. Sheriff Edwards says the responsible deputy who should have assigned Abel Suss' case to a detective died in 2019. But that does not explain why nothing was done with the case during the four years he was alive. The sheriff says they've upgraded their records management and says their new system should prevent this from ever happening in the future. I think this is embarrassing. I think that this has shined a light where there has been a shadow. And I think the fact that there's now all this public outcry, you know, it's one thing when just a local media outlet does something, but when it gets picked up and it goes viral, as it did with social media, and then you have national media start picking it up and calling it, you can no longer ignore it. The spotlight is too heavy now on this situation where people, not just in Louisiana, but people across the nation are now demanding answers as to why this happened. Can you explain how it's not a crime if he was 30 and she was 16? Walking out of the Tangipaho Parish Courthouse Tuesday, John Barnes didn't have much to say. What do you want to tell the public about your daughter? As he was walking out of the courtroom, we had an opportunity to actually confront him face to face, ask him questions about if he wanted to say anything, about whether or not he wanted the public to know anything about his daughter, who he admits is his. But he did not want to comment on anything. He referred all questions to his lawyer, Janelle Seacrease. Are you confident you'll win? Do you think that this is a win today, Janelle? Mr. Nakamoto, thank you for your interest in the case. Moments before this, inside court, losing custody of a child he fathered through an illegal sex act. We were expecting something totally different. We were expecting this uh, contempt motion to be heard because John Barnes was supposed to be allowing Krista, the mother, to get a phone call, a daily phone call at 7 o'clock from her daughter. Instead of ruling on the contempt motion, the judge, Judge Jeffrey Cash, reverses the custody decision until this July 15th hearing. It caught everybody by surprise. Today's ruling is temporary. A full trial is scheduled for July the 15th. But what he did was after our stories aired, the judge wound up reversing that custody decision and removing that child out of John Barnes' home. He made a comment in court saying that he's not going to be swayed by any sort of media coverage. He said this case will be tried in a courtroom. But it's interesting that he made that comment, though, because, again, those decisions that were made in that courtroom that day happened before a hearing was even held. And the only thing that changed was intense media pressure. Now things are happening fast after Abel Seth went public, hiring a new lawyer who took over her case for free when he saw the WBRZ report. People should be held accountable, right? The system failed everyone here. And the system, when that happens, should be held accountable, and we plan to do that. Louisiana law says the perpetrator shall not have custody of a child that was born from a rape. And so with the facts that are here in place involving that DNA test, there was no way around this other than to remove custody of that child from John Barnes' home. I feel like today is a win, and things are moving forward, maybe slowly, but it's progress, and things can only go up from here, you know, people are being held accountable and they are going to have to start doing the right thing. Baton Rouge attorney Jared Ambo is now representing Abel Seth. He says there's no gray area in the law. I think we have a clear cut case, right? I think that we have a clear cut decision that that can be made. Uh, but we but but we have to present that to the judge, right? We have to build the case. Uh, and today I think the judge took a, a, a great step, first step to um, finding justice in this case. Ambo said, you know, he's, he was brand new on that case. He had just enrolled that day after that hearing, but he was immediately trying to get all the files in the case, trying to do as much research as possible. But just from, you know, a quick glance at it, he could tell there are serious problems and 
could tell that there's this is a serious math problem that no one seemed to take a look at because it's it's black and white. It's you have facts. You have a 30 year old and a 16 year old. There's no denying that. And then you look at all this other superfluous stuff that has happened afterwards, and it really doesn't matter when you look at the facts of what caused the crime that day and what caused the birth of the child that was born from a rape. For Krista, seeing her daughter taken away from the man who she says raped her was satisfying. When I sat down with you, I didn't even know that. I thought maybe a few people would watch it on the news and then be like, oh, okay, that's sad and move on. Um, the fact that we've gotten so much attention and that it's really pressed the issue to make these people do what they're supposed to do. Abel says, says she was re-victimized over and over again after years of inaction by law enforcement and surprising rulings in favor of her perpetrator in court. It's, it's awful because it makes people not want to come forward. It makes people be scared and say, you know, well, I can't tell anyone about this because they're going to blame me. And I think that's absolutely outrageous. What she said is all this victim blaming that happened after the story initially broke. She said her life now is an open book because of the media. And she says she's grateful for that because no matter what anyone tries to say about her, all of her business is out there for the world to see. And I've come to a point now where I just don't care what other people think of me. If you want to blame me, if you want to say bad things about me in my past, that's fine. My life is basically an open book now because of the media. Those are the facts. I mean, when we looked at it, she lost custody of her child over a cell phone. Everybody keeps saying, well, there's gotta be more to the story. There's gotta be more to the story. There isn't more to the story. The documents show she lost custody over a cell phone and it was exposed. The judge undid what he did and we're waiting till this July 15th hearing to see what the finality is. I think there's gonna be a lot of victim blaming that goes on at this July 15th hearing. They're probably going to try to flip the script and blame Krista, claiming this was consensual, claiming that she lied. That does not matter. At the end of the day, John Barnes was 30. She was 16. All you have to do is take a look at birth dates. This is simple math. This is not a complicated case. It does not make sense as to why this just went nowhere in the court system and nowhere in the law enforcement system after reports were filed. The fact that the judge made this decision almost a month before the hearing was held is kind of a precursor to what's going to happen on July 15th, right? Even if there is a hearing on July 15th, because if the judge already sees that there's a problem with this individual having custody of the child, how could he on July 15th turn around and put custody back into John Barnes' hands, knowing that the child was born from an illegal sex act. So the fact that we expose it, and then within a week, the judge removes custody from John Barnes, what's the point of this custody hearing on July 15th? We've reached out to the district attorney to hear what his next plan of action is. We have not heard back from him, but from what our sources are telling us, he's probably going to take this case to a grand jury and let a jury of our peers decide whether or not a crime was committed. I think by putting this case before a grand jury, it kind of takes the blame and responsibility out of his hands and, and the DA can easily say, wasn't my decision, a jury made this decision. John, would you like to say something? His silence was all the answers that we needed to show that this situation went awry. It was a total failure in the court system, total failure by law enforcement, and we now have a face with a victim who was the face of this failure. It was just baffling to everybody that we had talked to as to how he was able to get custody of the child, which is why we took it on and we're happy that we did. That's why we're here, to fight the good fight for people who don't have a voice and to fight for the people who are going against the powerful.